Hey everybody, I am uh, heading southbound here in Washington, headed down to see a chainsaw museum today. I learned about this museum kind of by accident. I was working on an old saw that I got, and it's got like a really weird chain on it. It was a three-quarter pitch with a really strange gauge on it, and I didn't know anything about what I had going there, and it had a weird master link, so I called up Scott at Callitz River Rigging, and Scott, you know, he's super knowledgeable on the three-quarter pitch. He does all the processor chains and stuff, and uh, he's like, yeah, yeah, just send it down, and um, if we can't, you know, fix what you got, I'll call this guy Wayne Sutton. He knows everything about these old saws, and he'll be able to hook you up, so sent the chain down, and Scott you know got it fixed and stuff and then he said hey uh you really should call this wayne sutton he's the guy to go see he's got this museum down here and it is really something to check out he's got thousands of saws and everything you could think of and i was like okay so got the number from scott i called up wayne and super cool guy he was like yeah you need to come down here and take a look and uh told me that he's got over a thousand chainsaws in this museum and I'm not sure what we're in for, but uh, it sounds pretty neat. So uh, we're on our way down here right now to meet Wayne and see what um, he's got in this museum. It's kind of by appointment only, so it's not like open to the public. So he's got a lot of saws that, uh, that probably no one's ever seen before. And I'm really excited about getting it on video to show you guys and see what he's got to say. He's got a lot of stories and uh, where he's getting these saws and, and where they came from. And, the history about um, all this so hopefully get here we got about an hour drive to go and we'll meet Wayne and see what he's got well we're here with Wayne now and uh, just introduced ourselves and this is our first time walking into this museum so Wayne you want to tell your story of how you got started well I started out uh, you know I was always a bit of a collector and my first job after I got out of the service was working at a saw shop while I was going to college. And immediately I was seeing old saws and being told stories about old saws and it kind of piqued my interest. And sure enough, pretty soon I realized I was collecting chainsaws <laughs> and chainsaw stuff. But you know, my earliest, this piece here is probably my earliest chainsaw collectible that I got. And I was, uh, I was just maybe five years old or so. And I followed the Canadian chainsaw rep around at our local celebration until he gave me. I saw he was giving those to the loggers, and I wanted one too. And so I followed him around. Later, he was the rep when I got my chainsaw, my saw shop. He was the actual rep at that time. So we re, re uh, met. And Scott said you used to have your own shop also? Yeah, for 20 years. Up here, you see toy chainsaws of various kinds and a couple of liquor bottles that look like chainsaws. Oh, I like the drag line buckets there, look at that. Yeah, those were in a shop up in Fairbanks, Alaska that I used to call on and I just admired them a lot. And when they closed that up, the guy says, hey, are you interested in these? You always liked looking at them. Oh, absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> did you restore a lot of these yourself or? Most of the ones that are restored, I did myself, yeah. There's a few that somebody else did or I got them in that condition restored but you just stand in one spot for an hour yeah there's <laughs> definitely more stuff in here than should be in one room but i don't have another room so <laughs> so how many years have you been collecting wayne 43 years i think wow sort of in intentionally so what year was that that you started 80 80 yeah like this one here i got it already restored i didn't ever think i'd ever come up with one of those is there that's more unusual than the A model steel. It's a B, and there's only a couple of those that I'm aware of. So what it, what would you say is your uh, rarest saw that you have? It's be one of the one-off saws. You know, that one right there is pretty much a one-off. The jet saw, it's got a jet engine in it. I remember seeing this saw, like, was it on YouTube or yeah. a magazine? Maybe it was a magazine article or something. Yeah. So what's the rundown on this thing? Well, that was a project that... Uh, a steel engineer built and he kind of built it unauthorized <laughs> but it was such a cool project that pretty much everybody had to say yeah that's neat and then uh, he's off to other jobs these days so like what's the rpm range on it like how have you ever ran it i think it's if i remember right uh, forty-five thousand rpm is idle 
195,000 RPM is high, high end. So and what the chain you, takes it? The chain doesn't go that fast. The chain is all geared down. Okay. He really, this guy built, it's amazing what he did because he's got a, a jack shaft in here that reduces it the final time, but there's a um, gearbox on the engine and stuff that reduces that speed. So the chain travels at the normal speed, but with incredible amount of momentum. I mean, it's got something behind its short <laughs> monster. And you haven't ran it yet? I haven't. My agreement with him was I wouldn't mess with it unless he was here. <laughs> That's so, so neat. So I said, no, I'll do that. <laughs> and that picture there. Yeah, that uh, 100 foot up. The fellow that one of, one of the guys in that picture has been in here and he was telling me how they did that picture. It's actually several shots and the same guys are in it two or three times. Well, what do we do? We walk around? Yeah, well, we can walk around. I'll point out a few oddities. Here's, I'll just follow you around. This is a Dow low stumper, which is my kind of main project of the day. It needs a V-twin Indian engine. Uh, something like 1933 to 37, uh, Indian Scout. Okay. And I came up with crankcase. And if I, all I need is pieces, and I can make it at least look right. Look at that chain on that thing. Yeah, that's a Wolf Brute style chain. Holy smokes! It's a Scout motor, the engine that's going yeah. on with that. Yeah. And I would love to find one so that I could. Do it to it. You know, once I get the engine, then the whole thing gets restored. The only things that I've restored so far are the wheels and tires because you couldn't roll it around <laughs> and it isn't mobile. <laughs> yeah. It's 700 pounds or something. So I really <clears throat> did the tires and wheels. You know, I've, I've been really lucky in terms of the things I've got just by fluke I came across or, or whatever. But um, these are wolf machines or wolf link saws. And he was really a super early pioneer. Um, I have his patent paper up there for 1921 when he got a patent for one of his saws. But uh, this saw was built around 1919 in Portland. Weird. But he called them a link saw. They weren't called a chainsaw. But there were a number of guys, tinkerers of the era. But there was no one that really made a success of so it. Where's the gas tank? It's electric. It's electric. Yeah. Oh, there's the cord. Yeah. And these are new. Oh, I just saw a gasoline engine. Yeah. this. That's is, why it got me. This one, no one has any of those. So I'm hoping someday I'll come across one of those. But The old partners. Yeah. And that first one later was the first partner saw. That one is a predecessor to it, which is identical, and it was built by a company, and they named it Partner, and then later they created the Partner Company and all the Partner Saws, so gotcha. it's the first Partner, sort of. Yeah, before they came Partner. Before they <laughs> were Partner. Yeah, that's awesome. Yeah. And you can see some of these, these chains on these things are bi-directional. They would cut in both directions, so you couldn't put the chain on backwards. But if you took a chain on and off one of these things, it is a monumental task to do it. So you would be happy that it worked either way. If you put it on wrong, you'd be so pissed. You don't want to hit a rock. No, <laughs> no. Yeah. Huh. It's another interesting chain. This is the kind of chain that's on my grandpa's old one handled. Yeah. He had a shake shingle mill and pull it fine. That is huge. That's the biggest one I've ever seen. I know. It is me too. <laughs> I went down, a fella called me and said he had some old chainsaws. And I went down and, and, was, and he had a couple of neat chainsaws, but nothing that I didn't have. And, and I just, you know, I gotta save my funds for it's something I don't have. And then I looked up in the rafters and there was that saw and I'm like, are you getting rid of that? Goes, 16 oh, foot? 16 foot. And moved that a little bit and there was a 12 foot bucking saw. So I came home with both of those. Both of them. Hanging out the back of an eight foot bed <laughs> on a pickup. <laughs> I, I didn't get interviewed on the way home, luckily. I slid through. Well, I heard stories that they used to actually fold these. There are folding saws. The Forest okay. Service was the ones that used those mostly. Okay. Because they could pack them in. Real real uh, timber cutters didn't have folding ones much. Gotcha. I'd love to get They They exist. I've seen them. This area here are trophies and awards and things from timber sports champions of the past. 
and they've given me this or that to put up here. And I've got a couple more things coming if they come through, but uh, it's pretty neat stuff. I think it's awesome to get something like that. I used to do timber sports and enjoyed it and, and got to know a lot of those guys pretty well. I was never in the power sports, you know, the chopping. Uh, that's for animals. Yeah. And uh, I always ran engines and I could do pretty good with that. So let me ask you this. Out of all the saws in here, are they mostly donated or do you buy them or? Very high percentage donated. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, it's surprising how many that folks will look around in here and pretty soon they see, they, you know, this is where I had to bring my saw that I've been tripping over for yep, yep. years. And uh, so I get them that way often. If it's something that's super rare and it's just insanely needed and I start spending money, which I do a good job of keeping that spent. <laughs> It's pretty much all of the modern models of saws that Steel has ever built. And I once in a while will get a little nicer one and then trade it out in here to get the, the better one. But I've got a lot of them and I got some odd versions. I got a, a first year proto or first number one prototype of that little nine up there. There's a lightning hard top over here that was the third day of production. And that's pretty early and it's kind of a neat one to get. It was one I spotted in Idaho years ago, put my business card in there. And uh, at later, several years later, when the fella closed the store, he found my card in that saw. And he said, hey, are you out wanting that? <laughs> yes, I do. <laughs> and so I got that one out of McCall, Idaho. Well, I, I've been lucky, you know, in that with my job, I've traveled Alaska, Washington, Oregon, Idaho, pretty much every corner. In, found a lot of neat things. There's a lot more of it out there, I mean, obviously, but that's that really helped. You know, this is somebody's early effort at a racing saw, and even though I know this doesn't do anything to help performance, I had to leave it on there. <laughs> it's just too crazy. It's like a big old xylophone. Yeah. Is so, that plastic pipe? No, it's wood. Oh, it's wood? Yeah. I'm sure it bellows. Probably sounds good. And then a Chinese copy of the steel that was set in a shop for a long time. And I finally asked them, what's the story on this? I've seen it here for a year. And they said, it's seized tight. And it's just the guy won't come and pick it up. Huh. So I did. <laughs> this is a prototype of the 044. Really? When they were in the test stage, they were testing them up on Mount St. Helens. And uh, my store was one of the places they were bringing them to you know, keep them up or find out what's wrong or whatever. So that's a 44 that came in that way. There's a, a 64 someplace that b belongs to this top cover. And that was a prototype. And the 84s were also coming through my shop as uh, prototypes. But boy, once those things hit the market. What's an 044C? That has an automatic choke. There was only about one run of those built. Huh. And I sold that one to my uncle. And when he passed away, he still had never used it. And so I just, it became mine again. 056, there's a big boy. Yeah, there's so many different generations of that. Yeah, saw. It's, it was such a great saw. They were. I found a couple of those old still oil cans out in the woods. Nothing that clean. Yeah, finding clean ones. I, most of those I got um, when people would bring in a saw to trade in in a carrying case, you know, and you open it up and there's a can of oil and a chain and a whatever that goes with it. And and often they would have a good can of oil in there. And so I nabbed them up, and kept them, saved them because I, I've got that disease. It's awesome. <laughs> so this box down here, this wooden box, is the shipping crate for this saw. And that one I got from an old guy in Ohio who was uh, had purchased it uh, from steel, going to be a dealer in the early 50s. So that's a pretty unusual machine. It's really nice how you have all the literature on everything too, you know? Well, see, if I had more room, I'd have more of it. Cause believe <laughs> me, I have more of it. It's crazy. All the, I always, I have a kind of a special spot for military saws. This one is a... Uh, it says Bund on the top, which is a German government saw. This is a Swiss army saw for the Swiss army. 
I have uh, some two-man machines from Belgium and Germany and so on that they were military. And the cool part of the military machines is they're really taken care of super well and hardly used. So when you get one, it's a real, real treasure. Yeah, down here. Oh, a cutaway. Yeah, several cutaways. This Burnett, you know, not a lot of folks are even familiar with Burnett, but they built a lot of saws up in Canada and were very popular in the 40s, very early 50s. This was your throttle over here? Um, yeah, I think that was throttle. One's throttle, one's uh, clutch. Not a lot of anti-vibe on that. No. <laughs> <laughs> they were tougher than us, for sure. That's what cartilage is for. Yeah. <laughs> but uh, kind of a, a few of the efforts that John Deere made over the years, you know, including the two-cylinder Echo in John Deere colors and an XL12 in John Deere colors. Oh, wow, that is an XL12. Yeah. That's pretty God, unusual. Those were popular they saws. Didn't, oh boy, wasn't it? But they didn't uh, make very many of those. They were trying to get rid of home light immediately once they bought it. The old Dolmar. There's a Dolmar with a rotary engine and uh, the 166. That was a popular one. Big Mamma Jamma, yeah. Mm -hmm. I remember run, running one of those at a chain race one time. And my chain had never been on anything over four cubes, so I didn't even know how it was going to work. It's the Solo Multimont system, where they had a whole bunch of attachments, and they all used the same engine. And you can take the engine off of this one oh, wow. and put it onto something else, and it latches right on. Everything, that's all you have to do. No, no lashing up any wires or anything. It's just... It was, and that would go on another unit, not yeah, a chainsaw. Yeah, they had trimmers, the pressure washers... Um, blowers, you name it, they had everything. The chainsaw, though, didn't meet U.S. standards, so they weren't imported. That's a cool little top so handle. To kind of work at that. Yeah, that little Solo is remarkably similar to a steel 015, and so is that little Domar that. down there. <laughs> remarkably similar. Some of the kind of nutty things that have occurred was during the era when all the popular manufacturers were starting to go from gear drive to direct drive, and they were kind of winning the battle, the people that were building the direct drives. And Homelite realized that they were getting ran away from because all their machines were belt or, or, or gear drive. And they came to the conclusion that what people were after were more chain speed, not necessarily lighter weight. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and so they came up with this saw, which is a stick shift. And so with this one, you can shift gears and choose how fast that chain went. Well, then they realized after they built this that people wanted it lighter too. And when you added a bigger gearbox, it didn't help that. So this was a dead in the water real quickly. The exhaust on that guy. Yeah. Those old bow bars. Yeah, that's an early model 33. You know, McCullough built gobs of 33s, 35s, 39s. But that one, if you see, it's got a little teeny air filter opening and that was the first generation of the saws. That one's serial number 22, I think. Wow. I have 11, 22, and 33 of that. <laughs> it's weird how things like that happen. Let's see here. I don't even know where to start here, Wayne. It's just <laughs> everywhere. Either, so don't feel bad. It's everywhere. Um, you know, Titan up in Seattle was a big deal and for Washington State. They were... Uh, Mill and Mine Supply started building these Titan saws, and they really were one of the most popular machines in the 40s. And there's a whole run of them in here of all the different Titans that were built during that era. One of the oddest ones is just right up there. It's a Titan 100, and it has two crankshafts and two cylinders, and they turn opposite directions. And... Uh, they produced good power, but they would tear themselves in half. So they recalled them, and finding them is really difficult. They didn't build many, and then only a few of those actually survived. I mean, these guys here got away. Oh, yeah, 147 pounds. 147, you weighed it? Yeah. And, and they were the most popular saw out there. I mean, you find those everywhere. Every barn has one in it, it wow. seems like. And it is such a monster. 
but they also ran. That was a big deal. When the War Department was looking to get a chainsaw built in the U.S., the Carl Kaikoff was the guy that Mercury outboard. He came and investigated to see their sample they had gotten from Germany. And he said, oh, I have to bring that back and give it to my engineers so we can, you know, look at it. And they let him do that, not knowing that he was the only engineer in the whole company. And he didn't want anyone else to see it. And so he went back, took essentially one of his outboard motors and adapted it, put it together, made a chainsaw, and he sold thousands of them to the military. That's crazy. Yeah. I have one of his prototype ones actually down here. That This one here was early, early on. It didn't have a governor, and there's a bunch of differences to this one than the ones that actually got to production. Up in Canada, they were a leader also. They were really on top of it. They built a whole bunch of great big two-man saws. I mean, look at that thing. Imagine what that sounds like. I'm half deaf because it sounds like that. <laughs> <laughs> that red one there, that's the one that's cool. This guy here? Yeah, because it's two cylinders in a row. Like a Banshee motor. Yeah, and uh, it's just, you know, Super giant, giant power. And that's how Pioneer got their name, was IEL started calling these saws Pioneers. Gotcha. And then, then the name of the company changed. And the cool part is, is I have one of those that's the one-man version. And I can't even imagine dragging it through the woods, but it's a beast. But I'm sure whatever tree you moved up on, it started shaking immediately. Because <laughs> it knew it was, it was going down. And of course, the O&R world, Olson and Rice outfit in Los Angeles built these little engines for the military and uh, honestly they were really crummy engines but they were a little RC motor that they had adapted and then they started building all kinds of things with that little engine and so there's a whole array of things that you can get with them but these happen to be a bunch of the saws of different brands that they built using that little phony engine. And these all are the same motor. Yeah, basically the same motor. There's actually, there's there's two generations of motors here, but most of them use this one. And then like this one has a little different looking cylinder on it, but they were still the same guys. There's a cylinder there. They had such cool emblems back in the day. They did. They yeah, on everything. Logos. They were very proud of their emblems. It's neat. Yeah. This right here is the, an early Johnson Red. Yeah. Oh, yeah. They call them a racket. Lombard was one of the early builders. They used home light engines that were not intended at that time for chainsaws. Home light was just building power plants and air pumps and this and that. So that's what those engines came from. And this is a another Lombard, a slightly different version, two-man machine. Um, and they sold a fair number of those. Oh, you got some oil bottles there, too, I see. Yeah, yeah. They were hard to come by. Kind of interesting, I had several of them hanging in my shop and I had a, uh, a good customer, a great old guy. He was an Advent and um, he says, well, you know, you don't, you need to have an Advent oil bottle. And I'm like, what do you mean? And he says, well, an Advent wouldn't be out there in the woods with a liquor bottle. You know, I don't care if it's empty or not. <laughs> and I'm like, well, what's an Advent liquor bottle? He goes, I got one, I'll bring it. And he came and I have it here someplace. It's it's a Portland salad oil bottle. That's a that's a drip bottle. It says Portland salad oil right on it. It doesn't say somebody's whiskey brand. Mm -hmm. So that's an advent. <laughs> Got one. That's your raker. That's right and left tooth. Yeah, actually, it's pretty much all um, rakers or cutters, and then the, the rider depth stop is the one. But it, it it's somebody else's idea of how to do it, you know? They, they made it vicious looking. So what motor is this? That one is a 465 Yamaha, I think, with all the fins broke off and ground down. Really? Yeah. So they were all air-cooled, and we made them not cooled, so they'd warm up, because you had to 
make your cut within a minute. So you wanted to get it started and have it hot when you hit the wood. What fuel are you running? Well, it depends. Um, you know, most of the time we just ran regular fuel because we could, at that time, we could win with just because our motors had more power. Yeah. But um, eventually we were running some alcohol and then some nitro. Did you know the Rookley brothers out of El Dorado County? Rookley brothers? Mm -hmm. Mike and John Rookley. They race sods all over the country. Oh, really? Wherever. Yeah. I used to go to California racing. So I was in a shop up in Fairbanks, and I know this isn't a chainsaw, but this brush cutter was there, and I said, oh, that's cool. That I've never seen one like that one. And uh, a, a on few it. years later, they closed up, and I called up there and said, hey, is that brush cutter still laying in the back room? Sure enough, it was. And it took me a while, but I finally got it. And you got the McCulloughs here. Yeah, there's quite a few McCulloughs around this place. Um, some really, really unusual ones and a lot of almost unused ones. I find those really cherry ones and they follow me home. What's the one everybody likes? The, the 125, yeah. yeah. I've got some of those over here. I've got 125s and some of the pro saws. Go walk down this way. This this 125 here is essentially brand new. It's been sitting around in shops for since it was new. Wow. No gas on it? No gas. Probably the rarest one of those of these anyway here is this one right here, which is a uh, this little guy. Yeah. It's a McCullough Model 49, and the 49 was only built for a short time, a couple weeks, and then they changed it and changed the number. A lot to take in. <laughs> I've had people spend the night, so. <laughs> this is a cool machine. You might have to start charging me rent. A Turbomatic. <laughs> this thing has a hydromatic transmission, and it's got exhaust heated handles was made up in uh, Vancouver, Canada, I think it was. But it's a really pretty unusual saw, not a whole lot of them around. They say there were 75 to 100 of them built. That one there has a great story that goes with it. This guy here? Yeah. The, the family that bought PM Canadian, an own skill, they were friends with the fellow that owned the uh, New York Giants, which became the San Francisco Giants. And they gave him that saw at some point as a gift. And it sat in his office for years until he sold the San Francisco Giants. And he gave it then to the guy that was his grounds care guy. And his grounds care guy took it out and actually ran it a little bit and said, yeah, I don't need this saw. <laughs> and he then gave it to a friend of mine who was a chainsaw collector. And that fellow then... Um, only a year or two before he passed away, um, he gave it to me. So it's pretty neat. That's awesome. That is cool. History. And a beast of a machine, you know, like 8.9 cubes. It's, wow. It's mammoth. You're where the, where the kickback zone on a guide bar is, the, the front quarter radius of the tip. Crack, that's yeah. That's where the kickback comes from. I always kind of get a giggle when I look at this. <laughs> <laughs> There's, it's all kickback zone. Yeah. Those bow saws, most all the bow saws are pretty dangerous. They are. They really are. There's, it's a, interesting that they didn't get away from that immediately, but everybody tried it. You know, they all had Forest that. Service was big on them for a oh, long time. Yeah. Look at that chain. Yeah, there's some cool loops of chain. That's, oh, that's the, that's, that's a, the one you were talking about. Rides on the outside of the bar. That's right. That's a wolf straddle chain, bi-directional. He even said it was self-sharpening. I think he was delusional, but it uh, <laughs> it could, I guess, to an effect if it's going the other direction, the other side is sharpening. But So that's the one I called you about, the timber hog right yeah, there. Yeah, and that one's pretty much in original shape, military version. One. Yeah, I think mine was green underneath of it. It's Mine's uh, a little bit, it look, kind of looks like primer, uh -huh. like that red primer. Okay. But it was a green one before too 
Well, you know, there were some sold as domestic machines that had been green because when the war ended, they had a bunch of green machines they just built and the government quit buying them. So they just dipped them in another color and out they went. So the uh, Bill and Mine Supply Company that was really doing great in the 40s and they didn't quite turn the corner into the lightweight saws, but they could see people were doing it. So they decided they would test out and make a small lightweight saw. And what they did was they took their big monster machines and they built a small one. So it's a two cylinder opposed twin, just like the Titan E's and Titan Blue Streaks, but it's a small one and it's Model J and they're pretty unusual too. Not a herd of those around. Mm -hmm. This rig is a flash ring saw. She goes, oh, I was the interpreter and this. Yeah, it's got these things like letter of recommendation or hiring. Had the, the mill, they bought a lot of property. So my mom ended up buying the new off the crap. And I'm like, yeah. yeah. But it tells you how many hands from point A to point B and then what kind of marker was the boundary point so that markers so wouldn't wash away. But we have all those old topo maps and the information on the course, the surveyors did it. Go up to the drawer and pull them out of the tube and I can show, you know, most people, it's sad. To his brother, cousins and stuff. And, or not brother, his sister. You put propane in Diesel the saw. Cars, and, and once you got the thing charged up with propane, you can light this burner up front and it lights like a Coleman stove or, a, you know, you'd let it burn until it's red hot. And once it gets really, really hot, then you can lift up this cover and wrap the uh, starter and give it a pull and off you go on diesel. Holy smokes. And I think top speed's 3,500 RPM. So it's barely off idle, um, but I'm sure it stinks just like a diesel. It'd be fun. <laughs> It'd be cool. I got another diesel over here that's a little later generation one. It's up there on top, the green one on top. That's a diesel, and then this is the gas version of it. So they made it both ways. Look at those dogs. Yeah, well, they ran it, you know, you started it in this position, then you turn it upside down to actually run it. So the dogs are on correctly. It's just that you gotta turn it upside down to use it. Oh, wow. That's kind of an interesting concept. <laughs> and I- This one here, snap on. Yeah, I wanted to get a picture of this sticker or the decal on that bar and I so I posted on one of the snap-on collector sites mm -hmm. you know if anybody's got one of these it's in great shape I'd love to get some pictures and all I got back from snap-on collectors was holy shit we've never even heard of that <laughs> <laughs> so you I got guess. some bitter very bitter snap-on collectors <laughs> out there <laughs> they're looking for me now I didn't realize it was that unusual I knew that they were out there because I had repaired one for a guy once. And um, I walked into a secondhand store down at Long Beach a year or so ago, and that was sitting right right out front. And I'm like, really? How much do you want for that? And they wanted too much for it, but I paid them anyway. I got one of these drag saws, but I gotta go pick it up. An old boy gave it to me, and uh, I even have the manual for it. Do you know what brand? Uh, if you started naming them off, it was made in Portland. Vaughn? Nope. Wade? Nope. Thomas? White? Mm, no. Multnomah? It, maybe it was a white. Multnomah. That's what it was. Multnomah. Multnomah. That's kind of an unusual one. Is it? Yeah. He's yeah. got, he's got everything and it's sitting up on a loft and I got to figure out how to get it out of there. Well. It kind of looks like this when it's about this long. Well, this one here, which is in like almost new condition, I was at a saw shop and an old lady comes in and says, does anybody know someone that wants a drag saw? And all the guys in the shop pointed at me <laughs> and I don't really collect drag saws, you know, because they're big beasts, they take up space. I don't, I kind of focus better, but I couldn't help myself. I said, yeah, I'm interested, you know, and what do you want for it? And she goes, well, I don't know. You probably should look at it first. And okay, how far are you? And so I followed her home and the shop was, had been on fire or something. It was all black and sooty, no lights. It was dark in there. And she goes, it's at the very back 
up against the wall. And so I'm walking back there, kind of just in the dark, couldn't see where I was going. And I get back to the back and I'm feeling along the wall and sure enough, I, I feel a drag saw, you know. And, and I, what I, you know, I did was I shook it so that I could see if the rails were still tight. And it was like brand new, you know, it was really tight. And so I, hmm. So I walked it out of the building in the dark, <laughs> got it out to the front. I was black from all the black shit. I was just terrible. And <clears throat> I start washing up and, uh, and there's the, the blade for it sitting there brand new. And I go, has this thing ever been used? You know, cause it was all black, but it, there was no wear on it. And, uh, she goes, Oh no, my, my husband bought that the week before we got married, but I had bought him a two man McCullough chainsaw for the wedding gift. And that never got used. <laughs> oh my goodness. And it's never ran? And it never got used. Wow. And it still had these hooks were still tied on with twine for transport. And so I cleaned it off with gasoline. And as you can see, some of the paint came off just because it didn't stick good. And that's original paint. But that's all original paint. And, uh, it's just in beautiful condition. Yeah, that's a jewel. Yeah. Leo Carter's redone a couple of those when at the Plymouth Fair every year. He brings them out and yeah. gets them going. So I got a question for you. Um, I follow a guy, Donnie Walker, on YouTube. Uh -huh. And he's um, kind of messing around with these older saws. And he gets, like, printouts of the specs on each saw. He probably gets those off of Mike Aker's site. Okay. Chainsaw Collector Corner. Okay. Maybe that's where he was getting them. That's he, super neat because... Yeah, they're they're nice. Yeah. Uh, Mike Akers, who's a great friend of mine, don't get to see him much, but um, he's got a vast knowledge of chainsaw stuff. He, he worked in the industry his entire life. Because, I mean, there's no way that everybody knows everything about... All this stuff. All this stuff, and it's like lost knowledge... So that's really cool that somebody's actually putting it on paper. Yeah. You know, yeah. I thought that was really neat. Yes, it is. He was the first person that started computerizing the information, I think, that I'm aware of. Peter Steele gave you that. Yeah. And what's the story on this? You you wanted one and then yeah, you couldn't find it? We were visiting one time and he asked me what saw I'm looking for right now because, you know, I always have a list of kind of what I think I need to find. And I s said, you know, I'm missing a BL in my collection. I didn't have any, and I had never even had a lead. And I asked him, where did you guys sell those in numbers? He said, oh, we didn't sell many of those anywhere. He goes, I'll look in Germany and see if one will come up. And sure enough, it was a year later, a package shows up up in our warehouse. And the saw was in it. I just about fell over. And that came all the way from Germany for yeah. you? Yeah. Wow. Started on the third pull. It did. It started <laughs> right up. You know, I was like, wow. Um, and the History Channel was here, I think, when I did that. Or Discovery Channel, one of those places. Because they were both here. What a story. <laughs> and so from down that way. Yeah. And they built a, uh, somebody in the area built a road attack. Well, all right, Rain. Thank you so much for letting us come Thank in today. You. I really appreciate it. And uh, I'll probably be back, so. <laughs> I expect that. Come on back anytime. All right. Thank you. You bet.